Well, go on. Fetch it then. Find it, Raja. What have you got there? What have you found, eh? Let's have a look. What is that? Christ. The Centenaire by Alan Downer, with Stephen Pacey as Richard Hammond and Rosalind Adams as Paula Hammond. The Centenaire. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> alive and kicking. That is, I'm alive and it's kicking. He. He then. And his name's Martin, and he's g g going... going to follow in his father's footsteps and be the youngest centenaire ever. <laughs> Got it in one. Oh, Richard. Hey, it's gone seven. So what? I said I'd make you some breakfast. But oh. I, 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 don't, I don't... Now, get weaving and treat yourself to a new razor blade, right? Right. And put your best suit on for the lady from the Evening Post. She may have a photographer with her. And the time my mother gave you for Christmas. And be downstairs in ten minutes. Right. Do you want your egg fried or boiled? I don't want an egg, Paula, really. Fried, then. Look, am I boss in this house or aren't I? Ten minutes. That's what I thought. It's ready, darling. I'm... Here. Let's have a look at you then. Smashy. You look lovely. Now sit down, pour yourself a coffee, and get this inside in. Blimey, you have gone to town, haven't you? Bacon, sausage, <coughs> tomato, egg. Could be the only meal you have all day. Claire says Damien's kept very busy. Oh, maybe he is Paula, but that's in St. Helier. Still the height of the season there. It's the tourist. I park on yellow lines, drive too fast, and generally behave like idiots. Ooh. What? He's kicking again. Knock contractions. I'll tell you when, don't worry. Everything's under control, and Joan's standing by to run me to the hospital at a moment's notice. So don't glower. Oh, sounds like the milk. Oh, it could be Tom. I promised him a lift into town. This is very decent of you, Richard. Not at all. Thing was, Joan wanted the car in case the balloon goes up. <laughs> I suppose that's one way of putting it. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I say, Paula's looking in fine form. She's bossy. Ooh, all women are that, old boy. You know, I spent the whole weekend papering the baby's bedroom. But we'd agreed not to bother, but since Saturday morning, up drives this van with nine rolls of Snoopy wallpaper, paste and brushes, and all the accessories she'd ordered by phone on Friday. Well, never a word to me. Nesting instinct. Yeah, well, let's hope it'll soon wear off. Need all my spare energy for the shop. Of course, it's your silly season just now, isn't it? Yeah, from the moment we open our doors in the morning, the place is a seething mass of bargain-hunting females. I'm flaked out by closing time. Still, we're into September now, thank God. So things will be back to normal soon. That's true. How was your weekend, Tom? What? I messed about in the garden, mostly. The charity garden party's being held at our place this year, worse luck. And, of course, Joan insists everything's got to be just so. You'll probably enjoy it. Oh, I shall do a quick disappearing act, old boy, given half a chance. Get off down to the Carry Ann. Can't stand all those loud-mouthed, limp-wristed young men from the <laughs> theatre and nightclubs. I mean, this year's guest of honour, what's his name? Leading man from the opera house. Tony Baxter. That's the one. Oh, is he limp-wristed? He's a soak. With a very large chip on his shoulder. Awful man. Met him at the first night party. Had to show the flag. Joan insisted being on the management committee. But he's more unpleasant off stage than he is on it, if such a thing were possible. I gather he's filling the theatre. Yes. With a play about a man who's planning to have a sex change operation called Anything Goes. <laughs> You didn't get out on the boat, then? Hmm? Oh, uh, yesterday. Not for a while. Thought you might have. It was such a beautiful day. I wished I was with you once or twice as I battled with that wallpaper. 
Hello, here's the traffic. Nose to tail. With any luck, I'm going to be late. Hey, mister, is this real leather? It's calfskin, madam. Oh, it's a hell of a price. Mr. Hammond, you're wanted on the telephone. Oh, thank you, Christine. Richard Hammond. Ops room here, Mr. Hammond. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, got you down as duty centenaire for St. John this week, sir. Yes, that's right. Well, uh, sorry to have to throw this one at you on a Monday morning, sir. But somebody's found a body at Bon Nui Bay. Nearly finished, Doc. <clears throat> Just about. Andy, Morris wants to take a few photographs. Well, don't let me stop him. So we yours, Morris. Okay, Sarge. So, uh, what's the... I'll put it all in my report after the post-mortem. It's some bloody stupid holiday maker for a bet. Went in Starkers for a midnight swim. Got bashed against the jetty or the rocks, maybe. Don't look at me. All I'm saying at this stage is it's a lovely morning and I don't half fancy that cabin cruiser. Yes, she's pretty, isn't she? Mm. Zay Volker, Bremer Harbour. Sea Cloud. German job. <laughs> See yourself at the helm of that one, then, do you, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> Chance would be a fine thing. Oh, I shall be getting along. Yeah. See, see, the ambulance has got here. All we need now is a centenaire. Ted? Yes, Sarge? I suppose the centenaire has been informed, has he? Ops room have confirmed he's on his way. Uh, we should get his skates on him. With his young Hammond, he'll probably have to get here from St. Helier. Young who? Richard Hammond, the new boy. I believe it's his first term of duty. Oh, well, so long as he does as he's told. Sarge! Hello! Mr. Moolin's completed his statement. Coming! All right, now then. Uh, this is Mr. Moolin, Sergeant. So you're the gentleman who found the body? That's right. I, I was walking Raj uh, here. Do it first thing every morning and last thing at night. That's the trouble with large dogs, isn't it? They do need exercise. You didn't recognise the gentleman, I suppose? No, I, I didn't look all that closely, but uh, no. Gentleman's eager to get off to work, sir, if we finish with him. Then that'll be all for now, Mr Moolin. Thank you very much for your cooperation. You're more than welcome. Come along, Raj. Listen, uh, Ted. Sarge? Take a butcher's along the beach, will you? Assuming our friend was out for a moonlight frolic, he should have some clothing somewhere. OK. Trolley? What? Here comes your centenaire. Bloody hell. How old is he? Richard's all right. Looks 18. And he's wearing his best suit. You go easy on him. He's a good lad. Morning, Richard. Morning, Doc. Come and meet Charlie Leclerc. Charlie, this is Richard Hammond. Morning, Sergeant. Sorry I'm a bit late. Traffic. I understand we have a dead body on our hands. Yeah, um, over there. How much do we know? Not a lot. Male, I'd say in his early 30s. Excellent physique. Bollock naked. Quite severe wounds to the back of the head. Cause of death? Doc doesn't want to commit himself. Could be that, could be drowning. He'd been in the water. What about foul play? Not ruling it out. More suicide. But for my money, it's a midnight swim that went wrong. Wave caught him, bashed him against the jetty wall, curtains. Identification? Nothing so far. Sarge! Looks like we're in business. One pile of clothes. Neatly folded and stacked. Now, what have we got here? One wind cheater jacket. Fancy going through the pockets for us, Mr. Hammond? Oh, yes, of course. Mm, bit damp, isn't it? It's been out all night. Uh, one yellow T-shirt, one pair of briefs, one pair of slacks. All right, give me a... One pair of sandals, one yellow sock. Only the one? That's all. You sure? Well, unless it's in one of his pockets. It's not in his jacket. And it's not in his slacks. Ted? Yeah, I know. It's another job for me. Yeah, but later, somewhere between here and the sea. Yeah. So, Mr Hammond, what you got for us? Not a lot, I'm afraid. Plain white hanky. Bus ticket for 15p. Yesterday's date. Packet of French cigarettes. 
disc blur. Um, 19 left of a packet of 20. Damp like the jacket and rather squashed. And all that's in his slacks is one Bank of England fiver, two Jersey pound notes. So we still don't know who he is. Make a note of these bits and pieces, Ted, will you? And hand them over to Mr. Hammond for safekeeping. Yes, Sarge. And how about the body, Mr. Hammond? We got your permission to remove it? Well, I'll have to view it, of course. He's not very pretty. It is part of the job. Come on, then. I'll give you a guided tour. Well, Mr. Hammond, how are you feeling now? A bit better, thanks. And it's Richard, please. You had a tough break. Only dead body we've had in months, and it was on your patch on your first morning. Uh, there's no excuse for throwing up. Yeah. It takes a while to get case hardened, son. <laughs> About this missing sock. You did say it's an earlier son, didn't you? Please. That's your place in King Street, is it? Hammond's Leather Goods? That's right. Well, it's my father's business, actually. So? What made you stand for Centenia? Frankly, I'm beginning to wonder. Yes. <laughs> How's there you are, Mr. Hammond? The lady's arrived from the evening post. Oh, thanks, Christine. In the office, is she? She's been waiting for 20 minutes. Right. So sorry to have kept you waiting. I've been out on the case. Ah. Oh. Someone found dead at Bonnui Bay. Uh, how exciting. Well, anyway, Miss... Um... Uh, Matthews, Rosemary Matthews. Oh, and I'm new to Jersey, so, you know, you'll probably have to bear with me a bit. Now, um, let's see if I can read my own shorthand. <laughs> you are the youngest ever centenaire in the history of the island. The youngest on record, anyway. And uh, how old are you? Twenty-eight. You have to be over 20 and under 67. Uh -huh. m m m most candidates tend to be in their 40s and 50s. Candidates? You have to be elected. Oh, fascinating. Who by? The voters in your parish. In my case, the parish of St. John. I see. Isn't that a tiny bit dodgy? What? Letting people elect their own police force. That's what it amounts to, isn't it? I mean, if you knew someone had voted for you, say, and they got into trouble... Mightn't you be tempted to turn a blind eye? I don't think so. M Miss Matthews, the Jersey Constitution has evolved since the m Middle Ages, when the Connetable and his centineers, who were responsible for a hundred families, and his vantineers, who were responsible for twenty, formed the honorary parish police force. They were a safeguard of the rights of the individual citizen, a, a curb against the power of the seniors. That's our function still. And what you do now is you help the police? Well, you could put it that way, yes. How would you put it? We work together. In some ways, the states of Jersey police sort of defer to us. In what way? Well, only centineers and the Connetable, of course, he's the n number one in the parish, only centineers have the right of search or of granting bail or of <coughs> formally charging any person with an offence. Don't they mind? The proper police, I mean. You being sort of over them like that. I know I would. We're not over them, exactly. Do you have any training at all? We have to know about the law. <laughs> Mr Hammond, it does seem awfully dodgy. I'm... I'm not responsible for the system, Miss Matthews. No, but you're happy enough to perpetuate yes, it. Yes, I am. Why? I mean, you're not paid. Must take up a lot of your time. It's an honour. And? It's a way of serving the community. And? You're the one with all the attitudes, Miss Matthews. Why don't you tell me? Coming! Joan, thought it might be you. Just keeping an eye on my charge. Come in. <laughs> well, just for a moment. I take it nothing started. Not a twinge. Uh. Come on through. Like some coffee? Yes, please. You look a picture, you know. <laughs> Funny how pregnancy seems to suit some people. It certainly does me. Mm, did me too. I had an easy time with both the girls right the way through. 
It was just as well in Louise's case because she arrived at the height of the Suez business. Tom was a serving officer then, of course, and in the thick of things. So there wasn't any help from that quarter. Uh, you like it black, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, please, no sugar. Won't be long. So Tom was at Suez, was he? Well, not quite. He only got as far as Cyprus. I believe the grand plan was that his lot should be dropped as a backup force, except, of course, everything ground to a halt first. Dropped? You mean by parachute? Well, it's the best way. <laughs> That's how we met, actually. Came down badly once, broke a leg. They brought him into my ward. I'd never thought it of Tom. What? Oh. Well, that he was the, the action man type. I mean, he's so gentle. What's that got to do with it? Richard's gentle, too. Didn't stop him becoming a centenaire. No, but that's hardly the same thing, is it? Soldiering, centenaring, both required a little iron in the soul. Tom's got it, so's Richard. You think so? I'm sure of it. Why? He just phoned. Seems like he's got off to an awfully bad start. In what way? Well, mm, this is uh, confidential, just, oh, just no, for a moment. Sure. <laughs> but that they found a body down on the beach and Richard took one look and promptly threw up. A dead body? A bonwee? That's right, a young man. But, Paul, how dreadful. Was it an accident? It's too early to say for sure. Oof. That sent shivers right down my spine. <laughs> well, it is a bit close to home, isn't it? Hmm. Have they identified the body? Not yet, no, no. But Richard says somebody's bound to come forward. So, ladies, uh, you want to report a missing person... Yes, that's right. So, who's going to start? I will. I'm Mary Lynn, deputy stage manager at the Opera House. Oh, yes. And this is Liz Baxter, one of my ASMs. Her, her father is Tony Baxter, the star of our show. Ah. Uh, your father's a very funny man, Miss Baxter. Thank you, Sergeant. I'll, uh, I'll tell him you said so. Yes, Anyway, about our company manager... His name's Bruce Welland. He failed to put in an appearance at the theatre And he didn't morning. go home to his digs last night. I... Well, I rang his landlady. Miss Baxter here is concerned that something may have happened to him. Yes, I see. Is he usually reliable? Yes, very. I know something's happened to him, Mary. I know it's Yes, has. all right, miss. Take it easy. Perhaps you'd better give us the gentleman's description. He's 32... A good bit over six foot, uh, blonde, very well built. He's got blue eyes. And, well, well, I've got some photos of him at home taken on the beach. I, I, I could get you them if you like. I don't think that'll be necessary, miss. Thank you. I think I should tell you that a man roughly answering this description was found dead this morning out at Bonnui Bay. Oh, God. That's not to say it is Mr. Welland, of course. We shall need a positive identification. I think I should warn you, ladies, that the dead man did suffer quite major injuries to the head. Oh, it is Bruce, yes. I knew it would be. <laughs> there, I've got you. <laughs> Come on, Liz. He did love me, I know he yes, did. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course he did. Come on. It's time to go home now. Um, one more question, Miss Lennon. <laughs> Do you happen to have his address? Yes, he was in digs at 18 Wellington Street. The landlady's name is Haley. <laughs> he only really slept here, that's all. And he didn't do that all the time, if you take my meaning. Mm. This how he left it? Oh, well, I've had a tidy round. So it wasn't unusual him not coming home at night? Oh, he was a full-grown man, dear. And spunky. No note anywhere, then, Richard? Not that I can see, no. Uh, when did you last see him, Mrs Haley? I last saw him Saturday. Midday, before he left for the matinee. He came in my kitchen for his yoghurt. I used to keep it in the fridge for him. Did he have many visitors, Mrs Haley? Oh, none at all, except for young Sophie along the passage. They were friendly, well, you know. Sophie? Sophie Lyons. Works nights as an usherette at the theatre. It was her got him in here, in fact. Seems he wasn't happy where he was before. Uh, what about phone calls? Only from the theatre. Couldn't help overhearing. He took him in the hall. Right. Well, then, thank you, Mrs Haley. You've been very helpful. Happy to oblige, dear, I'm sure. Yeah. 
Is it all right if I finish off his yoghurts? Well, they'll only go funny, won't they? This was Bruce's office. Thank you, Miss Lynn. I'm afraid it's rather a mess. What are you looking for, exactly? Well, people who can commit suicide usually leave a note. Suicide? Is that what you think? Mm. You uh, seem surprised. Well, I'd have said Bruce was one of life's survivors. Was he the kind of man who swam in the nude, Miss Lynn? Well, I can't tell you from first-hand experience, Sergeant. But I'd have said very much so, yes. A nature boy. If you like. Mm. Aren't any socks here? Sorry? Black socks to go with the DJ. Well, I expect he got someone to wash them for him Saturday night. Are they important? Well, I... Centenaire Hammond's got this thing about socks. Haven't you, Richard? I see. <laughs> right, Miss Den, it seems there was no suicide note. Now, who shall we talk to first? Well, why not start at the top with the star of our show? I can't spare more than five minutes, mind. Oh, this is a hell of a strenuous show for me. And if I can't relax before cutting up, I'm knackered by the end of that one. Well, five minutes will be fine. It's about Bruce Wellen, sir. Oh, it came as a shock, I can tell you. Yes, I'm sure. I oh, mean, it's bloody inconvenient. Losing your company manager like that. As if things were bad enough already. It's only me that's holding the show together. I uh, directed it. I uh, <coughs> star in it. Yeah. And from now on, it looks like I'll be company managing the sodding thing as well. <sighs> Good for the vocal cords. Port. <clears throat> <sighs> so, uh, anyway, uh, what do you want to know? Uh, when did you last see Mr. Wellen? Uh, Saturday night, after the show. I might as well tell you, I had him in here for a bollocking. Yeah? Oh, we'd had a disaster second house, so I told him to get his finger out, or else. Or else what, sir? I'd push him off a jetty. <laughs> Joke, hmm? Oh, sit yourselves. Now, uh, what happened was, I told him to tighten up on company discipline. Go over a few things with the ASM, that sort of thing. So, uh, what would you think was his frame of mind when he left the theatre? Oh, he wasn't splitting his sides, but he wouldn't have been suicidal either. If that's what you're getting at. Was he a popular man, Mr Baxter? Yeah, he could certainly have pulled the birds. Did he have many enemies? Not in the company, no. <laughs> well, one big happy family, yeah? Yeah. Mr Chichester? Justin Chichester, yes. I play Henry. He's the Jew. One strives mightily to get away with it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your half-hour call. Would you mind just flicking that switch half for me, Petal? Half-hour, please. Um, this one. Thank, Thank you. you. Might as well see what I'm doing with Miss Slap. Now then, when did I last see Bruce Welland? You see, I haven't done Agatha Christie for nothing. It was Saturday night after the show in Jasper's. I was at the bar, chatting to some chums, and Bruce came in with his tail between his legs, ordered the usual orange juice, sat in a corner on his own, made a quick phone call and left. Observant, aren't I? About what time would that have been? Oh, 10.30ish. And uh, he was looking uh, grim-faced, to say. He just had a session with Chairman Mao. I'm sorry? Tony Baxter, Petal. Off stage is as funny as a cruising shark. And this uh, session was about the things that had gone wrong in the show. Well, that's how it started, dear, yes. Were you out front this evening, Bruce? I was for a while, yeah. And uh, what did you think of it? I've seen it go better. That is the understatement of the year. It was amateur night at Medicine Hat. The cuckoo clock... I'll have a word with Mary. What good's that going to do? Well... She can sort things out with Liz. Uh, There's only one person who can sort things out with Liz, mate, and that's yourself. I don't see what I can do, Tony. It's all over between Liz and me. Well, tell her it's on again. I can't. Why not? That's my business. It's your business to keep Liz happy. Because if she's happy, I'm happy. And so long as I'm happy, you've got a weekly paycheck coming in. Well, Tony, not even you can get me sacked for refusing to sleep with your daughter. Oh, come on, Brucey boy. I'm asking you to be nice to her, that's all. <laughs> Just till the middle of next month and we all go back to Blighty. What do you say? Mm, full of old world charm is Chairman Mao. And fatherly affection. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I can see what you're thinking, but I wasn't listening at keyholes, dears. 
This window and tone is both open onto the covered way, and sound carries. Oh, I see. There. Miraculously ten years younger. Oh, all right, then five. Now, then, next question. Yes, how well... How well did I know Bruce Welland? Oh, as well as the next man, I suppose. Perhaps a little better. We shared a tiny bijou flatette together at the start of the season. Yeah. Accommodation in Jersey's hard to find, you know. But Bruce took to bringing Liz back with him all the time, and though I'm no prude, God knows, it got so I was afraid to go in the front door, so mm. I asked him to leave. And he went. Mm. Moved into a bed sit in St. Sadie's, where the landlady wasn't so fussy. I'm Julia Whitney, Mr. Baxter's leading lady. Sergeant Leclerc, Centenia Hammond. How do you do? Hello. Oh, do sit down. Thank you. I expect you're wondering why I sent for you. Well, uh, yes? Well, I'm afraid it's not because I can throw any light on the circumstances surrounding Bruce's death. I can't do that. But I understand you've been speaking to Tony and Justin Chichester, and I think you should hear the other side of the story. Yes. Bruce was a nice young man who neither smoked nor drank. Mm -hmm. He was charming, efficient and respectful. I also happen to know that he had a widowed mother in Macclesfield or oh. somewhere to whom he gave generous financial support. You, uh, you liked him? Very much. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Baxter and Mr. Chichester didn't? I think they would see him through different eyes. Yes. You implied hostility. I'm afraid Tony feels hostile towards all of us, and he makes no secret of it. In fact, he shouts it round the island. About Mr. Welland? Yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, Liz Baxter, Tony's daughter, fell in love with Bruce head over heels. Oh, but one knew it couldn't last, and it didn't. I don't know exactly what happened, but suddenly they weren't speaking, and Tony was being beastlier than ever to Bruce. My point being, gentlemen, that whatever Tony may have said to you about Bruce should be taken with a pinch of salt. Ah, and uh, Justin Chichester? <laughs> yes, well, Justin's... Justin. Yes. What can one say except that he took a shine to Bruce during rehearsals in London? Bruce was a handsome boy with a very fine physique, and... When there was a mix-up over accommodation, Justin lost no time in suggesting Bruce should move in with him. Mm -hmm. Bruce, a little naively, agreed. Uh, needless to say, that didn't last either. Mm -hmm. Not once Bruce realised which way the wind was blowing. And the flat only had one bedroom. When the end came, it wasn't very pleasant. We were having one of our company picnics. The others had all gone for a swim, leaving Justin, Bruce and me. And I think they thought I was asleep. Hey, Justin. Hmm, what is it, Petal? Oh, I thought I should tell you. I've found myself a bedsit. Would you like to say that again? I've found myself a bedsit. I'm moving in at the weekend. Bit sudden, isn't it? Well, you know... And where does it leave me? Well, it was only ever meant to be a, a temporary arrangement, wasn't it? I mean, Look at him. You'd think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. What are you getting at, Justin? You led me on. Now why the hell should I do that? Because that's your thing, isn't it? You exploit people's weaknesses. That's how you get your kicks. Oh, come on. It's amused you that we should share a bedroom so you could parade your beautiful body and flex your lousy muscles. And always with that wonderful air of innocence, that bloody godlike detachment that made sex seem like a profanity. You're out of your tiny mind. I wanted you. Well... Think positive. With me out of the way, the field will be wide open to you. Oh, get lost. Ah, you'll soon find yourself a few chums a bit more obliging than I am. The island's full of them. Look, Justin, everybody backs a loser sometimes. You just take things too much to heart. At least I've got a heart. I'm going for a swim. Oh, teeth. I'm afraid I heard all that, darling. Oh. Hi, Julia. Where the heck did he get the idea that I'm bent? Wishful thinking, probably. I should forget about it. Justin is just a very sad little queen. And that's how it was, gentlemen. I see. <clears throat> and Justin never forgave him. I don't know what he may have told you about Bruce, but if I were you, I wouldn't believe a word of it. Five, ten, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Miss Lyons? Oh, go away. Can't you see I'm counting? Detective Sergeant Leclerc, Miss, State's of Jersey Police. And this is Centenia Hammond. How oh, do you do? Hi. 
We'd uh, like to ask you some questions. Yeah, well, don't be too long. I haven't totted up my programme money yet, and I've got to get the ice cream ready by the interval. I understand you were friendly with Mr. Worm. Oh, we shared the same digs. And when did you last see him? Uh, yesterday morning, and before that I saw him Saturday night. Could you give us a few details? Hmm, sure. Saturday night I was passing Jasper's on my way to the multi-story, and out he came. Mm-hmm. He said, could I give him a lift home? I said, yes. Well, I was going straight to a party, but oh, he looked so awful, I didn't have the heart to say no. How do you mean, uh, awful? Well, washed out. Oh, I see, yes. When we got home, he looked so poorly, I said, had he got the flu or something? Mm. He said he hadn't, and went into his own room. Well, I did it for a minute, and then I went in after him. He'd already started undressing. Oh, no. I'm OK, Sophie, really. Well, you don't look it. Oh, look, I'll be fine, as soon as I can get into bed and have a kip... Well, I'll stop if you like. Oh, there's no need. No, it's just been one of those days. That's all. <sighs> I know what you mean. I have them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I do at the moment it seems to come out all wrong. Oh, God, you're beautiful. Uh, definitely not tonight, Josephine. What if I just snuggled in beside <laughs> you? You've got a party to go to. I'll be all right. Go on. Well, I'll tuck you in then. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? Thanks, Sophie. Hmm. Any time. Sleep tight. Yeah. So I picked up his clothes and put them over the chair and I tiptoed off to my party. How would you describe your relationship with Bruce Welland? Well, <laughs> who wants to sleep alone? <laughs> you say you saw him again yesterday? Yeah. I was just leaving the digs when Bruce came out. Large as life and uh, twice as handsome. <laughs> I said... Um, I said, you've got a date, haven't you? <laughs> Gave a little wink. Yeah. Drove him into town, dropped him off here at the theatre. Do you remember how he was dressed? Oh, let me think. Uh, yeah, windsheeted jacket, yellow T-shirt and slacks. Socks. Bloody all right. I've got no idea. Is it important? We'd like to explore all avenues. Oh. About this date, Miss Lyons, you've no idea who he was seeing or where. Oh, I haven't a clue. All I know is... Um, he was happy. Yeah. Now, is that it? Uh, for the moment, I think, yes. Yeah. Right, back to my sums, then. I hope you balance. <laughs> what, and change the habit of a lifetime? Come off it. I start getting it right now, they think I've been on the fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> Andreas Wolf, stage carpenter. Uh, you're from Germany? From Hamburg, yes. I'm here for the summer only. I start at university next year. Mr. Wolf, uh, Miss Lynn tells us you have some information regarding Bruce Willand. I saw him yesterday. And what were the circumstances? In the morning I came here to the theatre. I have a boat at Bonne Nuit Bay. It needed a little work doing on it. I came to collect some tools. A boat at Bonne Nuit, eh? That's right. A cabin cruiser, the Sevolka. You don't know Colonel Langley, do you? He's a friend of mine. He moors his boat at Bonne Nuit, the carry I don't think I know him, no. Tall, distinguished looking. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you say you came in here for some tools. Uh, that's right. And Bruce came in. We got talking a little. I said I was going to work on the boat and that perhaps later I would make a small voyage. A uh, small voyage, eh? To Guernsey, perhaps, or Sark. Or a big boat, is it? Quite large. It belongs to my father, really. Oh. He is allowing me the use of it. And the Merc. I'm sorry? Uh, the Mercedes convertible outside. Is that your father's, too? No, the car belongs to me. It was a present. From your father? That's right. Mm. His name's not Crooks, is it? Listen, it's been nice talking to you, but... Oh, uh, where are you going? The boat is moored at Bonne Nuit. Ah, oh, I'll bum a lift, then. I've got a date out that way. I could walk it, but I'd rather conserve my energy, if you know what I mean. I'm leaving now. Say the word, camarade, and I'm right behind you. So I drove him. To Bonnui Bay? Yes, that's right. And when you got there? I went to the boat. And Welland? He watched me for a while from further up the beach. He seemed in no great hurry for his dead. Later I looked and he was gone. Gone? When the tide came in, I went home. Mm-hmm. That was the last I saw of him. How would you describe his frame of m- m- mind that morning? I don't know. He seemed... Edgy, excited. I expect it was because of his date. A special date? I think so. That's how he made it sound. But I don't know why. I I think Bruce Welland was... 
cutting dates all the time. So, what did you make of all that? It was useful. At least now we know a bit more about the dead man. Yeah, you mean like he was a randy fitness freak who sent money home to his mother? We know he was a non-smoker. So? There was a packet of fags in his windsheet of pocket. Well... It's a loose end. Richard, life is full of loose ends. Even non-smokers sometimes fancy a fag. And how did he light it, Charlie? By rubbing two boy scouts together? He bummed a match off somebody. Okay. But why did he have a bus ticket in his pocket when Wolf gave him a lift to Bonne Nuit? I don't know. And what about that sock? I don't know, Richard. All I know is it's been a long day. Paula, hmm? how does one lose a sock? Easy. You leave it in the tumble dryer. Now go to no, sleep. No. On a beach. He decided to go in for a midnight bathe. Oh, yeah. You take your clothes off, fold them up in a pile, and lay a windsheet of jacket over the top to, to protect them from the elements. The following morning, one of your socks is missing. Where did it go? Tide washed it away? Well, leave the rest of your clothes untouched, folded and dry. That was apart from the jacket, anyway. Hmm? Well, the jacket was damp, and so were the fags in the pocket. Everything else was dry. Hmm. Tricky, isn't it? Unless he... Well, we are talking about this chap Welland, aren't we? Mm. Unless he got out of his clothes. Noticed how fast the tide was coming in. Ah, oh, that's it was coming no, in. It was. The oh. tide was at midnight. No, and carried them further up the beach. What, dropping a sock on the way? Yeah, and then it got washed out to sea. Feasible. Yeah, feasible, yeah, but it all seems so unlikely. I mean, why all this rigmarole to go for a m- 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 midnight swim? And at Bon Nuit, of all places. Big breakers, rocks. Not my idea of a lark. Especially on your own. It doesn't add up somehow. It's a lovely feeling there, isn't it? What? Swimming in the nude. I've never done it. Of course you have. We did it together at St. Juan's. It was full moon. You can't have forgotten. You nibbled me all over. Oh, give me goosebumps just thinking about it. <laughs> Paula, I never went midnight swimming with you at St. Juan's or anywhere else. You did. I swear you did. Oh. On second thoughts, maybe you didn't. Maybe it was Victor Giselle. Good night, Paula. Good night, Richard. (laughs) Yes, it was Victor Giselle. How awful. (laughs) Go to sleep. (laughs) Thanks for coming over so promptly, Richard. It's better than trying to sell handbags to a horde of howling women. (laughs) Yes, I believe you. This way. Where are we going, Charlie? Inspector Voisin's office. Case has been referred to him. Oh, moving up in the world, are we? Yes. Here we are. It's me, Gov. Oh, yes, Charlie. Come on in. And this is Centineer Hammond. Hello, Richard. Oh, Richard and I are old mates, aren't we? Where was it we met? The multiple sclerosis doom? Oxford? You were with Tom and Joan Langley, I remember. Yes, yes, of course. Must have been Oxfam. My wife and I get roped in occasionally. Anyway, Richard, do sit down. Thank you. Charlie here tells me you've been immensely helpful on this Welland case. I've tagged along, that's all. Well, now, listen, Richard. Doc Alexander's got his finger out for once. We've got his post-mortem report on Welland. And the conclusions he's reached, in a nutshell, are these. One... The blow to the head was sufficient to cause loss of consciousness, but would not in itself have proved fatal. Two, the presence of seawater in the lungs indicates death by drowning. Three, time of death between 10.30pm Sunday and 12.30am Monday. And the conclusion that Charlie and I draw from all this is that Welland, who was a known fitness fanatic, went for a midnight swim, misjudged the strength of the tide, got thrown against the rocks or jetty, lost consciousness and drowned. A hypothesis borne out by the presence on the beach of the dead man's clothes in a pile, much as a swimmer would have left them. Any comment so far? There are some loose ends. You mean like the missing sock? Among other things, yes. I can't say they bother me. 
Still, in fairness, let's examine the alternatives. One, suicide. He was in high spirits that morning, and he doesn't seem to have been the type. And he left no note. So, let's reject suicide. Next possibility, he was knocked on the head and chucked in the sea. Who by? Well, he was a visitor to the island. He'd only been here a couple of months. He had no known enemies. So where's the motive? Well, not robbery, if that's for certain, because he still had seven quid in his pocket. No, Richard, we've examined this one from all angles, Charlie and me, and we're satisfied that Welland died an accidental death. I see. Thank you for coming over and for your help on the case. It's been much appreciated, hasn't it, Charlie? Yes, indeed. And let me just say this. I admire your wish to explore all avenues. Leave no stone unturned. I applaud it. I hope you'll go on feeling the same way. Bloody hell! Relax. What are you so uptight about? That was a setup, Charlie, and you know it. All this, you've been immensely helpful stuff, and didn't we meet at Oxfam? I've just been instructed to keep off. Why are you taking it so personally? I'll tell you why, Charlie. This has only happened because I'm a n- new boy. Otherwise, Voisin wouldn't have tried to pull rank. In decisions of this sort, the centennial should be consulted. You were consulted. I was patronised. We gave you our reasons, but go and beef to the Connetable of St. John. Beef to the Attorney General, if you like. Ten to one, they'll say, we're right. Welland died by drowning. It was accidental. It's not a cover-up, Sam. We are satisfied. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not. All right, Miss Lynn, I'll come quietly. Oh, it's you again. I'm trying to get this lousy gun to work. Sounded okay to me. It's not. You listen. See, now it works, now it doesn't. And when it's used on stage, it usually doesn't. May I take a look? Oh, please do. Ah, It's a firing pin. That much, I guess. Got a small screwdriver? Sure. Help yourself. This one'll do. Did you get anywhere last night? I mean, with Tony and Justin and co.? We learnt a few things about Mr. Wellen. And now you'd like to learn some more? Do you mind? Well, if you can mend that gun, anything. <laughs> Did you get on with him, Miss Lynn? No, not really. If I'm honest, I'm not very keen on the type. Was he a strong swimmer? Well, he did swim, certainly. And he had a lovely style, but... How can I explain this? Mr. Hammond Bruce was a show-off. He played to the gallery. Well, he liked to come into a party and... Uh, Sit down at the piano, play the opening few bars of Tchaikovsky's first, say, what a nice piano, and then get up and go away. (laughs) Well, first time you did it, it was impressive. Second time, you realised that was the full repertoire. You didn't know anymore. It was a con. And it was the same with everything. He did it for effect? Mm, To pull the birds, yes. And it worked? Not with me. So you think maybe he wasn't all that much of a swimmer, either? Mm, I think it's possible. Well, we believe... He did have a date at Bon Nuit that Sunday. Do you know of any lady living out that way? No, but Bruce was never one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Yeah. Usually it was one night stands. Except with Liz Baxter. Mm, I've got a theory about that. I think Bruce went after her because she's Tony's daughter. Well, Tony didn't like him. He gave him a rough time. Sleeping with Liz was Bruce's way of getting his own back. Then why should he finish the affair? He got tired of Liz. The sad thing was that the more unpleasant he got... The more she seemed to love him, poor kid. Yeah, maybe I should talk to her. Liz and Tony are renting a house at Gorey. Big, white, ranch-style house with a swimming pool. It's on a hill near the castle. It's called Eau du Mont. I think I'll go over there. Here, try it now. Hey, magic. We aim to please. Any more questions? You know where to find me. See you. Oh, sugar. Morning, Mr. Baxter. Oh, good. What the hell do you want? I hope I haven't got you out of bed or anything. Listen, Sonny, I was up at 7.30. I jogged three miles before breakfast. Oh. Well, shut the door behind you. Yes, yes, right. Um, is your daughter home? Why? I'd like to ask her some questions. What about? 
her friendship with Bruce Welland. My daughter's friendship with Welland was over. All the same. It, uh, it shook her up, this business. She's, uh, it's kind of uh, knocked her sideways. You know. She's in her room. Oh, thank you. But you go easy on her, yeah? I'll have you get through a tennis racket. And I, I want to see you afterwards. I'm by the pool. Is there any more news about what happened, Mr. Hammond? Well, the official view is he died by drowning. Oh. I'm sorry, Miss Baxter. <laughs> if only Saturday night had never happened. Saturday night? After the show. I was in the props room. He came in and, and shut the door behind him. Hi. Hi. Uh, you, you're going to yell at me again, aren't you? Because of the cock-up in the second act. No. Oh, hell, does everybody think I do it on purpose? I don't. I, I just can't think straight, that's all. I, I just can't. Oh, I mean, what did I do to you, Bruce? For everything to change like that suddenly. Where did I go wrong? Listen to me. Why are you giving me such a bad time? It's over, Liz. Why? <laughs> I want to live my life my way, to be free, to, to come and go as I please. That's the way I am, and that isn't right for you. You need a guy who's steady and loyal But and... I love you. Yeah, you think you do. I know I do. Liz, it's over. That's the truth. Now face it. Uh, look, your father's just played hell with me about this evening. I want you to come in Monday morning, say, uh, midday, and we'll go over those cues. Because if you can't do your job properly, we're going to have to find someone who can. Oh, and that's something else I've got to face, is it? Well, here's something for you to face, lover. I'm carrying your child. He stood there for a moment as if I'd hit him. And he turned and went out. I started crying. Next thing, Daddy was in the doorway. He... He can be very sweet sometimes. He he brought me home. Miss Baxter, does your father know? Hmm? That you're pregnant? I'm... I'm not, Mr. Hammond. I was just getting even with Bruce. And if he went out on Sunday night and drowned himself... Look, you, you needn't reproach yourself, Miss Baxter. I don't think it was suicide. Well, what then? Not murder. But, but who'd want to murder Bruce? Oh, is she? Very upset. They had a row on Saturday night. Yes. I... No. Do you know what it was about? Uh, she, uh... She wouldn't accept it was over. Uh, well, that's Lizzie's story. She told me on the way home. But what's all this got to do with... I'm trying to piece together Welland's movements on Sunday. Liz didn't see him on Sunday. She uh, never left the house. Yes, she said. Oh, just for the record, Mr. Baxter, how about you? What were you doing on s Sunday? If you want to know, Sonny, I had some friends in for a drink. And any one of them can confirm that. Don't forget to close the door behind you. Now, listen, Charlie, Richard. I don't care what you say. Bruce Welland was murdered. Who says? I do. There's no evidence. Isn't there? Maybe we've been looking in the wrong place. Convince me. I'll try. Let's start by examining your hypothesis that he went for a midnight swim. Yes, I'm listening. Yeah. Have you ever been from midnight swim, Charlie? In my time. Yeah, you'd agree that one of the charms of a midnight swim is the presence of a member of the opposite sex. But Welland was a nature boy, remember? He was also a show-off, a man who did things for effect. So, for the sake of argument, maybe he was not alone. You mean maybe he was still in the company of the lady he'd dated that afternoon? Yes, 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 if you like. So why hasn't she come forward? You tell me. All right. She might be a married lady or a girl whose parents might disapprove. 
Welland was pretty unforthcoming about the lady's identity when he spoke to Sophie Lyons, so he might have been keeping a secret. Yes. Also, he seems to have been unusually excited at the prospect of dating this lady for a man who was sleeping with ladies all the time. Perhaps what excited him was the clandestine nature of the relationship. It gave him extra kicks. Yes, I'll buy that. Good. Then maybe you'll also buy the fact that the lady's husband or father had a motive for murder. Shall I go on? Be my guest. The lady met Welland somewhere near Bonnui. She came by bus from, I don't know, somewhere like Ordequa, because yes. she had a bus ticket for 15p. 15 15 P. Yes. And this found its way, along with the lady's cigarettes, into Welland's pockets, right? Mm, right. Anyway, they have their resignation, and they may or may not have had their swim. I personally doubt it, because mm. I think she caught the last bus out of Bonnui that night, returning home the same way she'd come. Mm -hmm. And Welland hung about on the beach till she was well clear because the last thing they wanted was to be seen together. And this is where the jealous husband comes. Well, that's huh? right. He either followed his wife to Bonnui or somehow got wind of her assignation. And after her departure, he struck Welland a blow on the head, undressed him, and chucked him in the water. The assailant watches him drown, or maybe he even holds him underwater. Mm -hmm. Then he takes his clothes and folds them up, puts them in a tidy pile on the beach. A cool customer. Yes, indeed. But it was at this point that he started making mistakes. You mean like dropping the sock? Well, that was only one of them. The other was making a tidy pile of the clothes. Because Welland wasn't a tidy sort of person. Remember his office at the theatre? Yes. And remember what Sophie Lyons said about... Saturday night. What? She said she watched him getting into bed, and then she picked, picked up, up his, his clothes. clothes. And put them over the chair, yes. Oh, right. Well, Welland didn't care about clothes. Anyway, back to the facts. When we found them, the clothes were dry, but the jacket was wet. Why? Um, morning dew. <laughs> morning dew w wouldn't have squashed those cigarettes. Well, what then? Just suppose the assailant noticed that some blood had dripped from the head wound onto the windsheet jacket. Yes. Now, if it was to look like an accident, these stains would have to be removed. So, right. he took the jacket down to the sea and rinsed it thoroughly. But I wonder if he rinsed it thoroughly enough. How do you mean? Well, there could still be traces of blood on it. Then you've got your evidence. Charlie, all I'm asking is that we should at least examine the possibilities. What do you want me to do? I don't know, pull a string or two and get some forensic tests done on the jacket. Well, on one condition. I give you my word. If there's no blood on the jacket, the case is closed. <laughs> well, I'm on my way. And what about you? I've got to make a few more inquiries. Where? Is Diggs first, then the theatre. Well, I'll give you a lift. Come on. What exactly is it you're looking for this time, Mr Hammond? A diary of some sort. Desk diary, pocket diary. Any idea if you kept one? Sorry, I haven't. Well, do you mind if I look around? Well, who's to mind? It was Bruce's office. Want me to hang around, or would you rather be alone? I'd be grateful if you stayed. OK. Just come from Mrs Haley's. Oh, on the same errand? Yeah, I drew a blank there. She packed his stuff into a couple of suitcases. There was a vacancy sign in the window. Oh, life goes on. Yeah, I suppose so. Hang on. Found something. On this clipboard, phone numbers. Do you know any of them? Let's have a look. Hmm. That one's Tony's. That's Justin's, I think. Hmm, I don't know this one offhand. I can easily find out, though, if you'd like me to. I'd just ring and see who answers. Oh. What's the matter? This one looks familiar. Mr Hammond? Yes? Do you think he was murdered, Bruce? You do, don't you? Is one of these phone numbers... Does it belong to the person who killed him? Miss Lynn, what I'm trying to do, quite simply, is establish the identity of the woman Welland met at Bon Nui on Sunday. If we can find out who she is, it'll make life a lot easier. We'll start with the one that looks familiar. You're surely not suggesting that Tom had anything to do with it. You must be out of your mind. 
Why must I, Paula? Because we know the Langleys. What difference does that make? Sweetheart, Joan is a member of the Theatre Management Committee. I know that. But look, she knew Welland. He had her phone number. She lives at Bonnui. She smokes the same brand of cigarettes as we found in Welland's jacket. So what? This is ridiculous. You're asking me to believe that Joan was having an affair with Welland and that Tom found out about it and bashed him over the head? Could be. Oh, how far-fetched can you get, Richard? We've known the Langley's for years. Tom was a soldier. He's seen active service. He might even have killed. In the line of duty, maybe, but this is different. It's not Tom at all, nor Joan. If Joan had been with Welland that day, she'd have come forward and said so. Would she? Put yourself in her shoes. If it's accidental death, what would she gain by coming forward? Nothing. But it might well mess up her marriage. On the other hand, if she suspected that Tom had found out about the affair and killed Welland, she might tackle Tom about it, and they might decide on a plan of campaign. And for my money, that plan of campaign would be to keep quiet about the whole thing and hope for the best. I don't believe it, any of it. Paula, I don't like it any more than you do. But if Welland was killed, isn't it my job to find out who did it regardless? So what are you going to do? Talk to Joan, I suppose. Well, she's coming here this afternoon, so please, hang around and get it over with. Where was I on Sunday night? That's right. Oh, look, Joan, you don't have to answer. I don't mind answering, darling. It's obviously something important. What time on Sunday night? Between ten and midnight. I was at home. Alone? Yes. I watched television, had an early night. Richard, why do you want to know? Is it something to do with Bruce Welland's death? Joan, how well did you know him? Oh, not well. We met through the theatre. Perhaps you don't know, but Tony Baxter's been behaving very badly, being rude to all the wrong people. Once or twice he's gone to parties, got fighting drunk, and put people's backs up so badly, I've had to get Bruce to collect him, take him home, sober him up. I was grateful. That's about as far as it went. He made a note of your phone number. He rang me Saturday night. Saturday night? Just before 11. Joan, why haven't you said so before? I've only known it was Bruce who'd been drowned since I read today's paper. Yesterday it was all mystery body found on beach. I hadn't had a chance. So what did he say on the phone? Ah, uh, he said he'd had a row with Tony over Liz and Tony threatened to sack him, something like that. He was extremely distressed and not very coherent. He wanted me to put in a word for him with the management. I asked if he'd like to come over to tea on the following day Sunday. We could discuss the matter more fully. He said thank you, rang off. So it was you he came to see? Presumably. But he never turned up. Didn't worry me unduly, you know, theatre people. See, what did I tell you? Sorry, Joan, I, I had to ask. Nothing, <laughs> of course you did. I'm rather impressed. I think if I'd been guilty, I'd have been shaking in my shoes. <laughs> One question, though. Was it you who rang Tom before lunch and then hung up without speaking? I'm afraid it was. Why? I think we'd better tell him. He's all geared up to report it to the police as a case of heavy breathing. <laughs> Sorry to drag you over, Richard, but I didn't want to tell you on the phone. We found traces of blood on Welland's jacket. I knew it! Forensic carried out further tests while they were at it, and the blood group was the same as Welland's. Conclusion, the blood came from the head yep, wound... Yep, sustained before he went into the sea. Right. Marvellous! I've had a word with the inspector about it, brought him up to date, <laughs> in a discreet kind of way, <laughs> and it's all stations go again. So... Guess who's the blue-eyed boy? The main thing is, we're back in business. Back at square one and all. OK, so let's get back to the basics. Well, like what? Well, the bus ticket. We've been assuming it belonged to the lady friend, but that doesn't hold good any longer. He was going to see Joan Langley. Well, it wasn't Wellens. The German gave him a lift. He says he did. Then why shouldn't we believe him? Well, at the moment, that ticket's the only lead we've got. Wolf could have dropped him off at Haute Croix for some reason and driven on alone. That's not what he said. Why should he lie? Maybe we should ask him. I gave him a lift, yes, I told you. All the way to Bonnui. Yes, why do you ask? You're quite sure about that. You see, there was a bus ticket in Welland's pocket, Route 5, Sunday's date. We've now established it was issued at Haute Croix. If you gave him a lift all the way to Bonnui, we can't quite see how he came by the ticket. You're right, I did drop him off at Haute Croix. Uh, uh, may we ask why? He was being somewhat unpleasant. In what way? 
About the German occupation of Jersey in the war. He seemed to think somehow it was my responsibility. You know... Now, I can't understand why you haven't made any friends on the island. Well, who says I haven't? Oh, the way you a lot behaved in the war. The war was a long time ago. Nah, people have long memories. What did you know? For instance, uh, back in 1940, German planes machine gunned the streets of St. Helier. No, I didn't. Well, did you know that people were sent to Germany and interned or, or put in concentration camps? And that a lot of them never came back? No, I didn't know that either. And in uh, 1945, you, old people and kids died here of starvation. Have you seen the German military underground hospital here? No. I should. It's an eye-opener. It was never finished, but uh, 14,000 tons of rock were shifted to clear a floor space of 270,000 cubic feet. Now, that was some project, uh, a feat of engineering by any standards. But when you consider it was all done by slave labour, forced marched half across Europe and fed on a diet of gruel, well, they died, of course, a lot of them. And you are blaming me for this? <laughs> Just uh, reminding you, that's all, of how you came by this Merc and your cabin cruiser. Uh, <laughs> why are we stopping? Bruce, I am 20. Hmm? I was born in 1961. My father was a boy in the war. He too knew starvation. He too grew up in an occupied country and he hates no one because of this. And I hate no one and I don't feel guilty and I'm not going to feel guilty because I had no part in any of it. Now, please get out of the car. Hey? You are entitled to your opinions, but I don't have to sit and listen to them. As I drove off, I was very angry. It was foolish of me, maybe, because I think that is what he wanted. It was his fun that I should lose my temper. What happened after that? But as I told you before, I drove to Bonne Nuit. I parked the car at the approach to the jetty. I was working on my boat. I looked up, and there he was sitting further up the beach. I went on working, and soon after, I looked up, and he had gone. And you didn't see him again? No. Shortly after this, as I have told you, I drove home. Mr. Wolf, why didn't you simply tell us the truth in the first place? When we spoke before, I understood Bruce's death to have been an accident. It seemed unkind and unnecessary to draw attention to defects in his character. Sarge? Yes, Ted? Uh, I was just having a glance around this gentleman's car, like you told me, and uh, look what I found. One yellow sock. Matches the other one exactly. Well done, Ted. Now, Mr. Wolf. Perhaps you'd like to explain the presence in your car of one of Mr. Welland's socks. Oh, there must be some mistake. It's one of my socks. I keep a pair in the car. What's so unusual about that? Back to square one again. Mm. Help yourself to sugar. Thanks. Not that he had much of a motive, either. A row about the occupation. People have murdered for less. Not people like Wolf. Hasn't got the bottle. I don't know. We still can't explain how one of Wolf's socks came to be m mixed up with Welland's clothes. Yeah. Maybe uh, Welland just took it. You don't walk off with a sock. No. So how did he get on the beach? Unless... Yeah. That chap who found the body, Moulin. Yeah? What about him? Well, something's just struck me. Something he said in his statement. You, you got his phone number handy? Huh? Mr. Moulin, Centenier Hammond here. It's in connection with your statement of Monday m morning. Oh, yes. I wonder if you can help me. Well, I'll do my best. Well, in your statement, you say you're in the habit of walking your dog morning and night. Yes, that's right. N tell me, do you always take him down to the beach? Well, more often than not, yes, I do. And did you do so on Sunday night? Yes, I did. And about what time would that have been? Well, 11.30, maybe. About the time we believe the murder was committed... Mr. M Moulin, did you see anybody around that night? Anybody at all? I don't think so. The place was usually pretty deserted at that time. Or well, sometimes one comes across the old courting couple, you know, but... Uh, just a second. Yes, there was something. Not suspicious or anything, but... Uh, Go on. Yeah. Well, well, there was a car parked on the jetty. And as I passed, I got the impression there was somebody in it. I heard what sounded like a woman's voice. I assumed it was a necking session, 
Something like that. You s- s- saw two people? I got the impression there were two. Is that helpful? Well, I suppose you don't remember anything about the car. Yes, I do now, come to think of it. It was a rather flash convertible job. White, with the hood up. Make? Well, I f- say it was a Mercedes. It, it had a D-plate on it anyway, I remember that. Thanks, Mr Moulin. I think we got him. In your statement, Mr. Wolf. Yes. In your statement, you say that on the day in question, you worked on your boat at Bonnery Bay, and then after lunch, you went home. Yes, that's right. About what time would that have been? Uh, half two, perhaps, or maybe a little earlier. And you drove straight home? Yes, I did. You didn't, by chance, return to Bonnery Bay? No. You drive a Mercedes convertible? Uh, yes. A white one? Yes. Would you say there were many like it on the island? Well, I don't know. I doubt it. Two or three. Uh, Mr. Wolf, a car similar to yours, bearing a D-plate, was seen parked on the jetty at Bonnery Bay at about 11.30 on Sunday night. I was at home. The sock, Mr. Wolf. No, I told you, I, I can't explain that sock. <sighs> I should have a little think about it, Mr. Wolf. It's about time you started telling us the truth. I can't. I can't. Garden is looking lovely, Tom. Oh, oh hello, Joan. <laughs> oh, I shall be well up to scratch by the garden party. You've done wonders. <clears throat> I love this view. Do you? The cliffs, the boats, the sea. The Cheval Rock out there in the middle of the bay. Remember how you rode me around it one midsummer's day just after you brought me to the island? To keep ill luck at bay. I remember I nearly put my back out. <laughs> <laughs> Silly old superstition, really. I thought it was very romantic. I sometimes think I should never have brought you here. Why not? I should have sold the house, retired somewhere else. You love Jersey. It's where you were born. It's no place for you. It's too small, too parochial. There's not the scope for a woman like you. I'm happy to be wherever you are. <sighs> Joan. What? That's another thing I've never understood. What you saw in me. What do you see in me, Joni? Dry old stick over the hill. You could have done so much better for yourself. Tom, if I could have my time all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. I don't deserve you. Have you been happy? No woman could have made me happier. Then let's hold on to that. <laughs> we are getting maudlin. I'm going to sell the carry Ann. Huh? And I'm going to use what I get for her to do some repairs on the house. But you love the carry Ann. She's as good as sold. To hell with the ocean wave. My place is here with you. Yeah, come on, you're not crying, are you? <laughs> bit. Well, you mustn't. No, oh, don't take any notice. I think what we both need is a stiff gin and tonic. We'll have it on the veranda. Tom? Yes? I've just come from Paula's. And? Richard was there. This Welland business. It seems that a man's helping the police with their inquiries. Well, good. That's splendid news. A German boy. The stage carpenter at the theatre. His name is Andreas Wolf. You know, don't you? Yes. Oh, Joni, I'm sorry. Darling, we can put it behind us. I shall have to give Richard the facts, old girl. I can't let the boy be punished for something he didn't do. No. What is it, Tom? Andreas. Andreas Wolf. He didn't do it. Kill the Welland chap, I mean. He's innocent. I saw him drive away from Bonnui in the early hours of Monday morning. Saw him? That's right. There's no mistake, Richard. I promise you. We'd been together on his boat. We came ashore on the late tide. We walked along the beach together. I saw him drive off. Then, for God's sake, why should he claim he left Bonne Nuit in the early afternoon? I can only assume that he was trying to protect me. Protect you? Tom, I... We were lovers. I see. I met him at the theatre at the first night party. Joan had dragged me along. I stood in a corner trying to keep out of the way. I can't stand all that camp chat, as you know. Anyway, along comes this young man with a plate of sausage rolls or something, and I took one, and he would have moved on. Only that frightful Justin thingamy seemed to be trying to catch his eye. 
So I said something, and we got talking, and it turned out he had this cabin cruiser moored at Gorey. He asked if I'd like to see it, and I said yes. So the following Sunday I met him at Gorey, and we took her out. It was bloody marvellous. I'd never been on anything like her. She was the last word. The lines, the power, the luxury. She had every damn mod con you could think of. Oh, I fell in love with her straight away. And not long after, I fell in love with her owner. Sorry, but there it is. If I'd had the sense, I'd have stopped it there and then, and no harm done. But one morning I looked out of the bedroom window, and there was the sea volker at anchor in Bonnui Bay. I went straight down. Andreas was waiting for me. All smiles. I wanted to surprise you. Come on, come for a sail. It's a marvellous morning. Not a cloud in the sky. The sea was calm and golden in the sunshine. Andreas took her out a few miles and we anchored. He stripped off and dived over the side. I watched him. Sport in the water, like a dolphin. And then he disappeared. Dived under and stayed under. For what seemed ages. Christ, I thought he's never going to come up. I called him. Andreas! Andreas, for God's sake, Andreas! It was the first time I'd ever used his name. Christ, I thought, don't let him be drowned. <laughs> and then, there he was again. <laughs> Do you think I had drowned, Tom? Tom, are you all right? He came aboard. Are you all right? And I took him in my arms. Because, for a moment, it had seemed I'd lost him. It was a joke. I meant it as a joke. I'm sorry. We were discreet. Andreas took a permanent mooring at Bonnui and two or three times a week. He would take Sea Volker out and I'd take out the Kerry Ann and we'd anchor somewhere and I'd go aboard. That's what we planned to do on Sunday. But I couldn't start the Kerry Ann's motor. So for once we thought we'd risk it and go out on the Sea Volker together on the afternoon tide. We didn't get back till after midnight. Why couldn't he have said all that? Hell, Tom, all he had to say was you'd been out on the boat with him. What's wrong with that? Fact is, though, he didn't. No. You're prepared to make a statement that you were together. I've got much choice. What about Joan? She knows. Seems she's known for some time. She's prepared to stand by me if it all comes out. I can't keep it under wraps, Tom. I realise that. The police will have to be informed. Yes. Well, I'll be on my way then. No fool like an old fool, is there? Breathe deeply. In. Out. In. Out. Climb the mountain. That's my girl. What's latest? Oh, we've released the German boy. And Tom? We're going to keep it quiet. Oh, thank God. Poor Tom. Poor Joan. Yeah. You wouldn't wet my lips for me, would you? There's a little sponge there somewhere. Joan thinks of everything. She was marvellous, you know. She practically carried me to the car. There. Mm. How's that? Ah, smashing. Where's she now? Joan, in reception. Says she'll stay till it's all over. Oh, she's marvellous. Yeah, I think she'd rather be here than at home, with Tom just sitting there, refusing even to catch her eye. Christ, why didn't I leave well alone? Why didn't I say to Boisson, OK, it was an accident? What was I trying to prove? Oh, Richard. I'll call the nurse. Richard, no. What? Richard. What? I really cared much for Victor Tuzel. He had the most awful acne. (laughs) 
Richard, thank you for bringing me home. Thank you for everything. And and congratulations on the son and heir. Yes. Would you like to wet the baby's head? Well, I... I'm sure Tom would be pleased to see you. It'll take him out of himself. Please. In that case, I'd be delighted. Fine. Tom, Richard's here. He's a father. We're going to wet the baby's head. Tom? Oh, God, I'm frightened. Oh, darling, what have you done? Well, Doc, looks pretty straightforward. Yes. Army issue revolver still in his hand. Powder burns. The bullet went in through the mouth and out through the back of the head. Poor old Langley. Leave a note, did he? Brief and to the point. Darling, I'm sorry. Addressed to his wife. What had he been up to? Um, no reason why I shouldn't tell you. It's bound to come out now. He had a boyfriend. Oh, Christ almighty. Yes, you never tell, can you? You can say that again. You finished? Hmm. Just about. So yours, Morris. Right you are. Centenaire's been sent for, Ted, has he? He's downstairs now, Mrs. Langley. Seems he's a friend. Yeah, well, I'll give him a few minutes. Then I'll go down. You know, Richard, I've been having such strange thoughts about this island. Oh? All through history, it's been prey to invaders. The Gauls, the Romans, the Normans, the Germans. And still they come, in summer, hordes of them. And if it isn't rape and pillage thereafter, sometimes it comes to the same thing. Wild, young, uninhibited people looking for a good time, out for what they can get. Yeah. And in autumn they sail away again, caring nothing for the damage they've done and the upheavals they leave in their wake. Oh, you mean like Andreas Wolf? He wasn't the first, you know, with Tom. Last year it was Ian. He was doing a vac job. The year before, it was Kevin, a locum vet. It was the same every summer. I learned to make the best of things and prayed that no one would find out. But this year, someone did. Bruce Welland. Yes. Bruce made a pass at me at the first night party. I was amused and a little flattered, but I told him not to be silly. Then, Andreas happened. I was low and angry. I turned to Bruce for consolation. If Tom was having fun, why shouldn't I? We started meeting in secret. And while he was with me, Bruce made me feel like the only woman in the world. As I told you, he rang me late on Saturday night. Asked to see me Sunday, said it was very urgent. I told him to wait on the beach, and when Tom left, I'd draw the bedroom curtains. Eh? We used that as a signal. We made love. He was more attentive than ever. He even brought me some cigarettes. There you go, Princess. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> beautiful lady. Mm. You are the most beautiful lady on the island. You know that. Mm. You've got class. I wanted you the first time I saw you. <laughs> At that party. Mm. <laughs> you were so cool, so together. Mm. <laughs> Gorgeous. Bruce, I said, that one's for me. <laughs> What's funny? I'm a middle-aged woman with a big bum and stretch marks. What are you after? <sighs> I've got Liz Baxter pregnant. Oh, Bruce. Mm. She told me last night. It's her own stupid fault. But I'm not going to take any chances with her father. So, I need 250 pounds, like yesterday. I haven't got that kind of money. Oh, come on. We live off Tom's pension. Go on, ask him. He'll give it to you. Bruce, if you want to get an abortion for Liz Baxter, you can pay for it yourself. You're jealous, are you? Don't be ridiculous. D did you think you were the only one? Stop it. Please. 
course, I didn't think I was the only one. I know you better than that. I did think you cared something for me. What you're saying now makes everything seem sordid. Huh. I tell you what is sordid. You're other half than that German kid. Hmm? Didn't you know? They're out there now. I was on the beach when they met, keeping well out of sight. But I saw them. They were so randy they could hardly wait. And what's the betting they're at it now, like knives? I'd like you to go now. Two hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, let's call it a fee for services rendered. No. Then I'll put it about. It's not going to do much for the Colonel's reputation, is it? Or you're standing on the island. I'll count to three, and then I'll ring the police. <laughs> I said you got style, didn't I? <sighs> Listen, Joan. I've got to have that money. Now, why not be reasonable? If you won't go to the Colonel and ask for it, I'll have to ask for it myself. <laughs> it's no problem. Think about it. I'll be down on the beach. You change your mind, just draw the curtain. So long. And he put the cigarettes back in his pocket with a little smile and left. I didn't know what to do. I sat there, numbed and shaking. Finally, I went down to the beach. I thought if I appealed to his better nature, offered to go and talk to Liz about the pregnancy, talk to Tony if necessary. But he was nowhere to be seen. Then I heard the sound of a car radio, and I saw him sitting in Andreas Mercedes, parked on the jetty with the hood back. I went over. Now that I saw him again, I felt cold and angry. I felt my foot bump against a large stone that someone had brought up from the beach. I stooped to pick it up. It felt heavy in my hand. I stole up behind him and... I don't know how many times I hit him. But when I finally came to my senses, he was slumped there in the back seat. I instinctively checked his pulse. He was still alive. I formed my plan. All I needed was a few minutes. I closed the hood of the car and got in. I was lucky. A moment later, someone passed, a man with a dog. I pretended to be talking. Joan! Like, Please! I want you to hear everything. I undressed him in the car and dragged him down to the beach. Mercifully, it wasn't far. The tide was full in. But by the time I got him to the water's edge, he was beginning to come round. He opened his eyes and looked at me. And then he tried to say something. I pushed his head under the water and held it there. God! It was my life I was fighting for. My life with Tom. My happiness. The man with the dog passed again, but quite a distance away. By this time, I was sure Bruce was dead, so I went back to the car and collected his clothes together. There were some blood stains on the jacket. I washed them out in the sea. Then I put the clothes in a pile, as I would have done for a patient. Nearly over now, I felt a sense of elation. Then I found this one sock. Where was the other? Could it still be in the car? I decided to go back for it. And then I heard the engine of the sea rock, the sound of an anchor train... Tom's voice. They were back. He and Andreas were back. In a few moments, they'd be rowing ashore. I had to get home. But I couldn't think what to do with the sock. I should have taken it with me, of course, and burned it or buried it, but I didn't. One rotten sock. <clears throat> Come in, Sergeant. Your timing's perfect. I've admitted killing Bruce Welland. Now, may we please get the formalities over? You know what I've got in my pocket, Charlie? What? Letter of resignation. Uh, resigning, I am. Too bloody right, I am. Maybe they won't accept it. I have to accept it. They'll understand. Understand what? About the Langleys. They were my friends. You're not allowed, friend, son. You're a centenaire. Your loyalty is to the community, above all and beyond all else. If you don't like the heat, you shouldn't have come into the kitchen. I couldn't know it would work out like this. Charlie, it was all so needless. For Pete's sake, the girl wasn't even pregnant. Let me tell you something. 
You stood for Centenaire for all the wrong reasons. Personal advancement, political ambition, standing in the community. To prove to yourself that a little guy with a stutter could become the youngest ever Centenaire. Serve the community, bollocks. But you know what irks me? A couple of days ago, I thought you had it in you. Shows you how wrong you can be. The night. George, another large whiskey, please. Yes, Mr. Ryman. You're all shouted it. I'll have a large gin and tonic. Oh, no, Mr. Baxter. George. One large gin tea, right? I haven't seen you in here before, have I? I wouldn't have thought of Jasper's was your cane to kiss. It was handy. Ah. Celebrating your success with the Welland case. Sort of. Oh, God, I wouldn't mind being a policeman. Must be a doddle compared to what I have to put up with. Oh, you should have seen the house we had tonight. Till last we had an old of that one, and God knows what Justin was doing. He's always been over the top. But there's no holding him since he's taken that German kid under his wing. German kid? Hmm. The stage carpenter, Wolf. Suddenly they're as thick as thieves. Oh, well. It's all part of life's rich tapestry, I suppose. The king is dead. Long live the queen. What? Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, oh, dear, sir, you're right. <laughs> oh. Did I say something funny? <laughs> oh, I must have. Oh. I'll get a cop for you tomorrow night. <laughs> you're just what the show needs. <laughs> <laughs> a laughing policeman. <laughs> what are you doing with that envelope? There wasn't any money in there, was there? Man, Mr. Baxter. Well, where are you going? Home. To my wife and son. You haven't had your drink yet. His name's Martin. And if he ever says he wants to be a centenaire, I shall be the proudest man in Jersey. Good night. That was The Centenaire by Alan Downer, with Stephen Pacey as Richard Hammond, Rosalind Adams as Paula Hammond, Dillis Lay as Joan Langley, Nicholas Courtney as Tom Langley, John Warner as Tony Baxter, and Miranda Forbes as Liz Baxter. Mary Lynn was played by Shirley Cooklin, Justin Chichester by George Parsons, Julia Whitney by Patience Tomlinson, Bruce Welland by Chris Jenkinson, Sophie Lyons by Glynis Brooks, Andreas Wolf by Jonathan Elsom, Detective Sergeant Leclerc by Geoffrey Matthews, and Inspector Voisin and Mr Moulin by David Goodison. David Brierley was the police doctor, Olive Crow played Mrs. Haley, Stella Forge played Rosemary Matthews, and Stephen Garlick was Constable Ted, the constable in the Ops Room, and the barman. The play was directed by David Johnston. <laughs>